Welcome back. Good morning, Pacific. Good afternoon, yes. East. East Coast. Good morning, Midwest. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, yes. We can't be coastly biased, right? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Good morning, uh, Seattle. <laughs> yes. So wherever you are joining us from, welcome. Welcome to this fifth installment of Morning Coffee with Shonda Buchanan and our very special guest today, Mr. Matt Rimley. And we are beyond the vote today. Yeah, no, we're beyond the vote. Uh, and we're incredibly excited that you all are joining us. Uh, as you know, we are gearing up for elections and there's so much happening across the country uh, that we need to pay attention to and be mindful of you all. And it's, you know, for communities of color, um, you know, for natives, for black, brown, you know, communities. So we have to be vigilant. So we're here to talk today with Matt Rimley and uh, weigh in ourselves because, you know, the personal is political. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us again. Um, I'm Michelle Calhoun and of course my co-host and I'm her co-host, Shonda Buchanan. And we're, we're really, really excited today because we do have the chance to talk with Mr. Rimley, with Matt, if you don't mind um, me calling me by your first name, an amazing strategist, activist, educator, and human and environmental rights warrior. You cover the range. Yeah, it's impressive. <laughs> it's very grateful to have you on our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Absolutely. And also a father and a family man. So we want to make sure we hold up those titles um, because they're equally important. I appreciate that. That's the most important and that's the, the driver behind what I uh, do in the work. Three beautiful children. Oh, three beautiful children. Beautiful. That's a blessing. Can we hear those names? We have Audrey, who's the oldest, uh, Chaitan, who's our, our middle boy, and then Chante is our youngest. Oh. Beautiful. Some strong names. Thank you. Well, we we thank them for sharing you with us this morning. And they're this all afternoon. sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so we welcome you, Matt. Um, <laughs> And we want to welcome our audience this fall day. Um, I know that we're in different parts of the world and different parts of the country. And if you could just go to the chat box and tell us where you are listening from, we would mm. love to know what cities are represented because we are spread out and we want to hear from you. Yeah. You know, there are a range of places to spend your time and we are gracious that you want to mm. commune with us. And, and tell us your nations as well. Like, where do you hail from? Uh, you know, you know, just kind of let us know who you're connected to. You want to say your ancestors too. Absolutely. So, Amitaki api chante washte nape chuzapi, waki wanatan emachiapi, iamo slaha emataha, ate waiagi Charles Rimley, ina waiagi Donna Harrison, etu kashila wakantaka, etu kile wopila, etu kile. My English name is Matt Remley. Uh, my Lakota name is Wakian Wa Anatan. And uh, that translates to He Charges with Thunder. It's an ancestral name of a great, great, great grandparent, uh, grandfather from the, the late 1700s. And his responsibility, I'm uh, Papa Lakota. Um, there's seven bands or seven kind of sub tribes of the Lakota nation on uh, Honk Papa were the most northern kind of in the North Dakota uh, area. But uh, his responsibility um, was what you call a winter count keeper. And what the winter count keeper did is they documented the history of our band or our tribe throughout the year on a, a buffalo hide. And um, it was kind of a history of what uh, uh, of the tribe as well as document um, with the things we went through throughout the year. So I was very honored when that name was passed down to me a number of years ago by my family. Um, in our kind of Lakota, uh, well actually before that, my, my parents are uh, Charles Remley and Donna Harrison. So my mom is from uh, Standing Rock, born and raised in uh, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in uh, Fort Yates, North Dakota. Um, 
and so uh, with the naming in our kind of um, cultural teachings, when a name is passed on, uh, typically a role or responsibility that comes with that. So it's not just that you're you're given a name, but you you have a responsibility to fulfill, and so um, it. it it's uh, quite daunting sometimes to try to uh, fulfill uh, responsibilities, but um, these are some of the reasons why I, I try to do the things that I do to um, engage in uh, protecting our environment, our, our children, our youth, our next generation, our elders, mm -hmm. protecting our languages and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I live out in Seattle though. I, uh, my family moved to Washington Actually, when I was fairly young, uh, there's not a lot of work in the, the Plains region. So uh, my, my father uh, is in construction. He took a job at the Hanford Nuclear Power Plant, which is like most polluted site in the um, uh, Western Hemisphere. So there's an irony uh, given the work that we do. But yeah, he used to go to work with a, a radiation badge to uh, see how much exposure to radiation. But, once that job was finished on Eastern Washington, we moved to Western Washington, where I primarily grew up about 40, 50 miles north of Seattle, uh, near the Tulalip Reservation. And uh, I moved to Seattle in the late, mid to late 90s, when I was hired as an organizer with the Community Coalition for Environmental Justice in, in Seattle, and have been there uh, ever since. So, But my paid work, I actually work for uh, back up in Tulalip, in the Marysville School District and the Office of Indian Education where I do counseling with primarily Tulalip high school students. So yeah. different yeah. hats I wear. Wow, that's a lot. You know, thank you for sharing that, Matt. That's that's a lot and I think it it moves to everything that you just said moves to I think the intentions, you know, that we want to set for this show and you know just for the people who are viewing, it's like that importance and that connection to heritage, you know, and that the honoring of our ancestors, you know, in all ways. So that's one of my intentions for the show. And just to share, um, you know, my nations, what I track down, what I trace down. I was born and raised in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And my mom always said that we were uh, Indian is how she said it. And she, we thought we were Blackfoot or she said we were Blackfoot. And I'm like, okay, but where's the proof? And then we were like, well, maybe we're related to the Indians here because one of our great, great uncles lived with one of the Odawa tribes and they adopted him. And so I was like, okay, well, where's the proof? And so a part of my journey for writing uh, my book, I wrote a book, um, Matt, I don't know if you know, but I wrote a book called Black Indian. And uh, I traced my people down to the Kahari, it's a Kahari in North Carolina, Sampson County, North Carolina, also the Eastern Band Cherokee. Uh, I've also have documentation from one of my great aunts that a great, great grandmother was full blood Delaware Cherokee um dna says seven generations back i've got my full blood american indian ancestry so just want to honor all those people and also my mom you know velma cloud <laughs> velma stafford and then my dad john buchanan and, and he also uh, gave us the oral history of being choctaw uh, and african so it's really important to um to honor those ancestors so that's my intention um today uh, just setting that i know nichelle you want to set some intentions too so uh, thank you. I'm actually I'm on the I'm in the listening chair um, today because I'm I'm really excited to learn from both of you in this space. And and Shonda and I say this all the time. This is a knowledge sharing space, not a not an interview, because we all come. Sometimes we're invited to speak and sometimes we're invited to listen. And I feel like I'm in the listening chair. And so that's my intention is to listen and to learn. Um, and my intention is to be in that learning chair. I'm very, I'm very interested in your work around indigenous women um, and highlighting and visibilizing what is happening to indigenous women. And I think as um, a woman who identifies as black, um, this was new for me to learn about um, the disappearance and murder of Indigenous women. And I want everyone listening, if they're not familiar, I want you to open your ears and open your heart and open your mind for one, to honor these women whose lives were cut short, but also to learn ways in which we can create alliances. So that's kind of 
what's in my my spirit today and i'm just thankful to be in the learning seat with both of you mm -hmm. so i want to offer up this song for that sister renee davis and you can tell us a little bit about that after uh so the way i learned the song it's a a healing song one of our um, we had a women's circle in the mountains of california and this lakota woman uh, she came up and she said, well, we're going to sing a song for this, uh, the sister um, who's grieving. And so I'm going to offer up this song for that sister Renee Davis, because the way I learned it, we, you, you need to say the names of the people that you're praying for. Um, so I want to uh, offer up this song for her. Um, <laughs> Tuka ya ya he am sawe ya ni di kelo Tuka ya ya he am sawe he Tuka ya ya he am sawe Tuka ya ya he am sawe ya ni di kelo Tika ya ya he am sawe he. Tika ya ya he am sawe. Tika ya ya he am sawe. Ya ni di selo. Tika ya ya he am sawe he. Tuka shia ya he am pawe. Tuka shia ya he am pawe. Ya ni big telo. Tuka shia ya he am pawe. Hey. I hope. Thank you for sharing. You want to tell us about that sister? So Renee Davis. Uh, is a muckle was a muckle shoot tribal citizen um, who was uh, killed by murdered by King County sheriffs uh, four years ago. Uh, Renee lived on the uh, muckle shoot reservation. She was a uh, her, she worked in the culture department and or, uh, with the youth in the schools on the Muckleshoot Reservation. And uh, four years ago, uh, she was, you know, having a hard time and um, sadly, uh, uh, you know, she, uh, you know, her, her boyfriend at the time thought she was suicidal, so called 911 and King County Sheriff's uh, showed up to her house uh, they didn't identify themselves. They just uh, opened. They actually coaxed her her three year old uh, daughter into opening the door. Mm. And uh, when once they opened the door, they she had a, a three year old, and I'm forgetting the age of uh, the second child. But they actually took those two children and set them on the outside um, porch. Uh, Renee was in her bedroom, and. Um, they her, her door was shut they just busted through the door and she was uh in her bed with a, a blanket on over her excuse me and one of the sheriffs yanked the blanket off of her and then uh, one hand was a handgun and then the other hand was the clip and you know it wasn't loaded um and they they fired you know uh, three shots. She was pregnant at the time. And her last words were uh, the guns wasn't even the guns not even loaded. And um, she died. And uh, her her children that they had put on the porch, obviously had come run, running back inside the home mm -hmm. and uh, witnessed what had happened. Wow. They didn't call for um, an ambulance or anything. And uh, she, she passed away, and that was uh, four years ago uh, on October 21st. And so yesterday, we held a, kind of a memorial. Uh, the, the family's obviously still been in, in mourning over what had happened. 
and uh, this was the first time that they kind of decided that they want to specifically her, her sister wanted to uh, speak out on uh, what had happened. So we held a uh, Makoshu, I'm sorry, I should have said it. They're about 30 miles south of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyways, the, the family, the Makoshu tribe, their tribal council, they all came up to, to Seattle and mm -hmm. uh, we held a, um, it was a, a rally march, but more in kind of our, our native uh, flavor. Uh, we brought out uh, out here, you have what's called canoe families. Um, mm -hmm. These tribes on the, the coast are very much into uh, mm -hmm. the, the canoe culture. And so uh, the, the canoe families came out and offered songs and then kind of our urban native population, as well as uh, if anybody follows the news, you probably know Seattle's, <laughs> we're kind of an active group up here in mm -hmm. all kinds of protests and uh, actions. We're actually on like, 150 straight days of uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protest in, in Seattle. Like it's, wow. it's it Thank nonstop. You. Thank you for that. It, and um, yeah, so a lot of folks involved with those actions came out to support too. Mm -hmm. uh, so the intention was to not only draw attention to what happened, but to bring some healing to uh, the family. Uh, we're really big into uh, a lot of times that some of these marches and events you know, the, the names of those who have been stolen um, are lifted up, but we forget that they have loved ones and families who have to live with this every day. So we always like to bring out these families to give them love and support, mm -hmm. to lift them up. Mm -hmm. And then we also invite other, any other family uh, or families who've also lost loved ones to, mm -hmm. to police violence. And so, you know, it's not just a, a support native thing. It's to support anybody who's lost loved ones from police violence. We wrap them in blankets and um, we wipe them off with uh, our Eagle fans and sing some songs. But So yeah, uh, unfortunately the, the sheriffs who murdered uh, Renee Davis, they found no, no guilt yeah, on them, of course. Sounds so. so like Breonna Taylor. That sounds so like just, you know, and. The other thing, Michelle, you were talking about how indigenous women from my research are the most murdered women in our country. Uh, uh, African-American women are the um, second highest death rate due to domestic violence with their partners like that. So uh, it's really important, you know, definitely. And I love how, Matt, you said bring the loved ones along because even though we're saying the names continually and we're demanding justice for them, uh, their families are still out there, you know, suffering too. So um, I wanted to ask you, how did, how, so this is that activist work that you do. How did you move from that, rather, what came first? The bank, like you, you also advocate for divesting in certain banks and corporations that don't serve us, you know? So, so what came first, second, third, you know, what, you know? <laughs> Ray, um... To, to be honest, I actually, I always say I'm not an activist or an organizer. I'm just a uh, Lakota Wimachash. I'm a, I'm a Lakota man. And uh, when I say that, there's responsibilities that come with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Lakota means that what that actually translates to is to be a good relative. And ah. so to be a good relative in any situation, if there's support or help needed, then mm -hmm. that's what we're supposed to do. And when we say we chasha, that doesn't necessarily translate to English like man, but it translates more to like a responsibility mm. that you've grown into certain responsibilities and um, you're to fulfill them. Uh, and part of our, our cultural teachings, um, we, we, we talk a lot about, in, and I know you know this, that uh, each tribe globally you know, uh, you're, you're going to find very similar teachings about there are certain pa places and spaces that are sacred and they need to be uh, protected. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, like uh, you go down to uh, Brazil and you'll hear uh, the tribes down there talking about prote protecting the Amazon. For us Lakota, it's the, the Black Hills, the, the tribes out here, the waters and stuff. So uh, protecting these uh, landscapes from uh, desecration you know, it's just been a part of um, what we unfortunately have have yeah. to do. 
uh, in terms of things like divestment or um, these other strategies, you know, I've kind of, kind of, kind of come to look at that is like we we have a toolbox basically, and inside that toolbox, there's numerous tools we can access to address these uh, systemic issues that we're fighting. So mm -hmm. divestment being one of them, you know, marches is one of them, direct actions is one of them, voting is one of them, you know, there's so many tools that we need to access. And I personally don't think that any one is more important than the other. Mm -hmm. It's they're all uh, necessary, uh, you know, going to the courts is a, a tool to, to utilize. And um, why we took up divestment, that was during our fight against the quota access pipeline. And mm -hmm. And it was in, um, I think it was in September when that was kind of heated up. But if you remember when they, um, the, the, the company brought out their private security. I private remember arms. that was just the egregious thing. Nichelle, I'm sorry, you were gonna add on. No, 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 I was just shaking in my hand and agreeing, yes, I remember that. Um, and when they brought out the, the dogs and released them on people. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, there was a backstory to that day and that um, our cultural historic preservation officer uh, what was being denied access to, even though it's on reservation land, was being denied access to go map out and uh, show exactly where grave sites were located, cultural sites were located, sacred sites were located. So he finally had been given access earlier that week, documented exactly where those all them uh, sites were located, brought that map and uh, information to the mm -hmm. court, uh, excuse me, the judge who was overseeing the tribe's um, lawsuit against energy transfer partners. Mm -hmm. And it was literally, uh, so the judge received and then shared that information with that corporation. Wow. Um, you know, so they would hopefully not bulldoze those areas. Oh. It was literally the very next day that company sent in those bulldozers and you saw what happened. Yes. You know, they deliberately yes. did that. So we were thinking like, they, they obviously don't care about mm -hmm. desecrating graves. They don't care about desecrating mm -hmm. sacred sites. Yeah. Um, they, they're not even buying the, uh, you know, they, they don't even have permits. So the law is not obviously not of a yeah. uh, detriment to them. So mm -hmm. the only thing these corporations understand is money. Yep. And so we decided to target uh, the financial institutions who are really the ones behind these corporations, mm -hmm. whether they're the banks or insurance companies, because these corporations don't have billions of dollars to <laughs> just build a, a massive pipeline. Hey, yeah, it's the people who are actually investing in them. Precisely. And making so money Wells off Fargo. of it. And making money. So Wells Fargo is someone who reaps the benefit 100%. from that. And yeah. <sighs> financing what? and uh oh go ahead i'm sorry no 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 keep going i'm sorry I, uh so how we zeroed in on wells fargo specifically there was um uh food and water watch they're based here in seattle and they released a document that showed all 27 banks that were financing that particular pipeline and wells fargo happened to be one of the top three or two or three that were given money to it um in Seattle, uh, the city of Seattle, that was their bank. And I have previous relationship with a, a lot of uh, city council members for other work. And, and I reached out to uh, one of the council members. Um, we had previously got this city to uh, pass a resolution opposing the construction of the pipeline. They, they were actually the first non-tribal government to do so. Yeah. Uh, but that was actually kind of a organizing strategy on our part. We wanted to get them on record saying they oppose the pipeline. Yep. And then we came back saying, okay, you're saying you oppose this pipeline yeah. because of the human rights violations. Yeah. Well, here's something you can actually do about it beyond just a resolution. Yeah. Um, resolutions are nice, but it's literally just words. Yeah. And uh, But you, you bank with Wells Fargo. They're one mm -hmm. of the major banks behind it. So if you truly support Standing Rock, then uh, you know divest your seven billion, or excuse me, three. It was a three billion per year on a seven-year uh, contract that Wells Fargo had with the city. So 
not just some small change, but I mean, small change for these banks, but yeah, you know, exactly. And then me uh, closing my account. <laughs> yeah, no, I, exactly. Can we, can we get a list? Like, can we get that list and pop and pop yeah. it on? You know what I'm saying? For I love yeah, ancestry. No. Go ahead, Michelle. No, that's, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, and I'm, I'm so thankful that you went there early on because I think that people don't know where to start, right? When they think about the, the multi-level nature of the oppression and the injustice, it's like, hmm, where do I start? But what I love is that you got real specific. You said, okay, wait a minute, who is financing these corporations? Okay, the bank, all right. Seattle, is banking with Wells Fargo? Okay, then we go that direction. And I just, yeah. the strategy is incredible. And it also shows to us, the audience, look at the, the links, look at the connections yeah. and follow the money. Follow yeah. the money 100%. And uh, one thing, so when we launched that, I, you know, obviously we got a council member to agree to sponsor it. But the very first thing we did um, after getting a, a sponsor is a broader outreach to other communities for support. Mm -hmm. So um, because we know that whether it's Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, Bank of America, you know, they're, they're typically involved in uh, a lot of dirty dealings beyond just uh, fracked pipelines or, or, or stuff like that. So here in Seattle, um, there had has been a group of, uh, they called it, um, oh, why am I spacing the name? But anyways, they were uh, organizing to stop the construction of a new youth jail mm, mm. detention center. Uh, and it was primarily uh, young black youth who had been exactly. organizing for maybe six years, you know, trying to stop this multi-million dollar project. So we started doing research on who's financing, who's funding this um, a, a youth jail. Wells Fargo happened to be one of the those banks giving money to it. Come so we on. reached out and we work, you know, brought them in um, to say, you know, here's another angle we can bring in to, to fight this bank. Yeah. And uh, the third group we reached out to just south of Seattle is the city of Tacoma. Mm -hmm. And in Tacoma is, uh, I think, the largest immigrant detention center in the Northwest. And uh, uh, we have a very large uh, uh, migrant population up here in the in the Northwest region, mm. and so uh, there's a lot of organizing to try to shut that uh, detention center down. And uh, you know, same thing. We we started uh, looking into who's financing these immigrant detention centers mm -hmm. and private prisons, mm -hmm. and the, the same banks are are involved. Mm -hmm. So we were able to bring folks who were opposing mm -hmm. that uh, detention center. Uh, in as a part of that campaign. So part of that logic was, you know, we're going against a Wall Street bank, mm -hmm. who's well financed, uh, they're powerful. Yeah. And as organizers, we need to be very uh, strategic in how we build our, right. our alliances. Yeah. So, you know, for for some folks, it, it might might have been enough that they're building, uh, this company's building a pipeline that's threatening the water of Standing Rock. For others, you know, they might be concerned, mm -hmm. but that might not pull them in. Yeah. Uh, so if somebody's primary uh, focus is on stopping that detention center yeah. uh, or stopping that youth jail mm -hmm. from being built, you know, that's awesome. You know, let's bring all those voices to the table. And so we were very deliberate when we, what we did is we crafted a, an ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, we called it a socially responsible banking ordinance. Mm -hmm. And it did two things. Uh, one, we obviously was uh, to get Seattle out of Wells Fargo. And but two, what it did is it created uh, uh, when when the city enters into any contract with a bank or whomever, mm -hmm. uh, they'll ask for a request for proposal. Mm -hmm. And it, what, what we did is in that request for proposal for RFP for mm -hmm. banking specifically, we created this uh, basically like a checklist. And uh, what it says is if you the bank want to do business or this contract with the city of Seattle, here's a set of criteria and um, basically like check marks, you know, so yep. if you're investing in private prisons, you know, that's a negative check. If you're invested in uh, fossil fuels, that's a negative check. If you're invested in detention, so it puts pressure on them, yeah. pressure on the banks that, 
if they want to, you know, in the case of Seattle, it's a $21 billion contract, you know, so which, which more, um, what's more, uh, you know, putting it kind of on them, you know, yeah. do you want to be invested in these pipeline, which you're probably not going to make that much yeah. back on your loan mm -hmm. compared to a, a contract like a, the city of Seattle that can then go mm -hmm. and uh, last for, for many years. So that, that was passed. Yeah. Um, That's so congratulations for having that passed. And can we get a playbook for how to like uh, change, you know, how to speak back to power. Like I like the steps that you are listing are steps that I would like to advocate for, <laughs> you know, and particularly with the, uh, so I teach um, uh, university level as well. I've done that for 20 years and I'm familiar with the proposals, but to have something along those lines added in, um, you know, you may not invest in here, you may not invest in here, you may not invest in here that's the way that they understand that those kinds of um, institutions understand uh, what needs to happen and if no one is checking them if no one is saying don't do this they'll continue to do it so what's in some documentation once they can see it it's like oh people are paying attention yeah so and i want to also just just as a um, um talk about the unity that you that you are doing and i want to thank you for it because I'm just going to go back to the first documented, um, you know, uh, moment of unity and alliance between African Americans, uh, African Americans, Black Africans, and Indians. From my my understanding, it was in the 1500s when, uh, in Hispaniola, there was a Spanish governor who documented how the the natives of that land came and stole his black slaves because they were like why are you oppressing people in our you know why you know so i guess they tried to oppress the the indigenous population and they could they could leave you know they could run run away because they knew their homeland but the africans couldn't so they went and like took them with them so that's like that's that sense of alliance is something that is incredibly important that we have to continue to do to support each other uh, when we are oppressed by the same regime, which actually is funded by this, the, their money, yeah. Same people, yeah. And even the uh, first attempted settlement of uh, Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, or, or that that you know, Pilgrims <laughs> story, yeah. uh, the the tribes had actually wiped out the uh, the Europeans who tried settling there, but they had had some African uh, slaves that they. Wow didn't kill and mm -hmm. uh, they uh, uh, integrated into the, the tribes there, you know, yeah. so technically Africans were settled there way before the pilgrims ever did. So. Thank you <laughs> for saying that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that acknowledgement because I think um, for me, I think, like I said, one of the biggest things was realizing, wow, there's so many intersections to our struggle and people yes. tend to have we tend to have our blind spots right so for example i'm hyper focused on black women but i may not be um looking at the breadth of things so i was really connected when i started reading about indigenous women and just understanding from my perspective i saw that link and the big link that i feel is like this historical trauma right that constantly replaces us in these mm -hmm. systems of oppression throughout time. Um, and so that that is something that kind of just stuck to me, even when you were describing um, what was happening at, at I'm, I'm looking at my notes, even as you were describing what was happening at Standing Rock, right? The, the use of the dogs, um, the denigration of sacred spaces, right? Like these are things that just repeatedly happen. Um, and without that historical context or without seeing that our struggles are aligned, people may sit in their blind spots. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really thankful for you giving language on, for one, how do we start to fight back against these um, plantation owners, right? Or yeah. uh, these, set, these colonial settlers, and then how we also um, start to recognize um, our mutual struggle under this system. Absolutely, absolutely. And then also, so one of the questions that we wanted to ask was what are the most pressing issues in Seattle and then for American Indians or in the indigenous population abroad, but it seems like you're answering 
those questions already. <laughs> and, you know, it, it seems like we have to pay attention to, you know, our domestic issues. We've got to pay attention to, um, you know, where that money goes that, uh, that divests or, or, or penalizes us or punishes us or imprisons us or, um, but if there's some other issues, you know, that you want to sure. make sure that we're paying attention to along with the voting piece, you know, please. Okay. Um, and alignment. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I, I, I see like a, a lot of the issues, I mean, they're, they're all kind of inter, interrelated, they're very uh, uh, similar. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I kind of always go back to, there was a, a Western Shoshone uh, mm -hmm. elder her name was uh, uh, Sisters, actually, Mary and Carrie Dan. Mm -hmm. And they uh, longtime fighters to pr protect the, the land rights of uh, the Shoshone mm -hmm. people. Shoshone, uh, Western Shoshone in Nevada, uh, it was mm -hmm. the uh, testing grounds for a good majority of the nuclear bombs and stuff like that in the US. So it's just a radioactive toxic area. Anyways, uh, mm -hmm. when Carrie Dan came to, to Seattle, she said something that really kind of resonated with me, mm -hmm. uh, or a lot of us, and, you know, she was talking about whether it was the issue of MMIW, missing and murdered indigenous women, um, uh, pollution of our land and stuff, but what she said was uh, that we won't be able to stop any of those issues mm -hmm. until we understand that it all starts from the desecration of all of our first mother, mm -hmm. the earth, because mm -hmm. the mentality that you can just go and mine and drill and take from uh, the earth and um, without a reciprocal relationship, just a kind of a take, take, take. Um, that's the same attitude that fuels all the other uh, issues of violence, period. You know, and she specifically tied it to women and said uh, that's the same attitude that uh, patriarchy carries that mm. you can just take take it for uh, our own mm. whatever you know mm. so in mm. terms of issues yeah I, I think uh, uh, globally we all have to and we're, we're seeing that you know out here in the northwest we just spent um, you know a good month plus and it could get hit down in LA too under uh, the smoke yeah uh, from all these yeah uh, the West wildfires just, we've got fires raging still yeah yeah um, and so you know, another thing that um, I wanted to share, you know, one of my aunties, she, when I was young, she, uh, she kind of told me that, you know, when I was getting into organizing that different people are, um, have other, they're kind of specific areas of um, not interest, but what kind of motivates or drives them, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the issue of, of mascots and or representation or the uh, water, air, you know, uh, children, our elders language, you know, building intersections. And what she told me is, you know, they're all um, equally important. They're all necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. our our job is to connect and, and link up with those uh, various struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of work I personally do happens to be centered around clean water, clean air, protecting our land, but building um, alliances and uh, strategies for, for how to uh, go about addressing that. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to answer, you know, you, you, you brought up kind of that playbook question. Yeah. Uh, so Moses Scott talks, um, we formed that specifically because out of that Wells Fargo fight, so many people around the country and to be honest, around the globe were calling us and asking that very question. Yeah. I mean, we had people in yeah. Germany saying, we have the largest coal mine in the world happening here in Germany. How do we stop it? You know, and um, so we formed Moses Scott Talks to be like a uh, clearinghouse, you know, for, mm. for that playbook. You know, here's the banks. Here's what they're invested in. Here's a sample ordinance. Here's a sample. Here's how you can um, uh, run a similar campaign. And actually, the very first people that reached out to us were down there in San Francisco, and. Wow. Uh, where Wells Fargo is headquartered and uh, a young, um, she's actually running for California State Senate right now. Her name is What's... Jackie Fielder. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Black Women's Democratic Club. 
the oh, California. Right yeah. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so, she's, yeah. She, so she's uh, amazing. And um, she she called uh, myself and uh, my uh, co-founder, Rachel mm -hmm. Heaton of uh, Moses God Talks, and said, we want to do this in San Francisco. And so she led a successful campaign to get San Francisco to divest from Wells Fargo. And then we awesome. just started shooting that across the um, you know, awesome. country. So w another thing, you know, um, to, to bring it kind of like up into some of the modern um, current protests, you know, we did a lot of re uh, research mm -hmm. on um, these banks and you, you, you find they have a lot of money tied up into police unions mm -hmm. and oh, what are they called? Like the, their foundations that they have. Yeah. Like the we've we've got some of those so uh we're trying to get jackie lacy out of office here in in los angeles because the police unions fund her uh and then she's been the one to the one of the you know district attorney who has essentially not done anything when when the cases for of color for black men come to um come to her um her courtroom so yes so so the defunding of the police uh, and the police unions <laughs> disbanding, <laughs> you know, those unions if they Absolutely. are not serving us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like these same banks are also funding, you know, the, the military style uh, uh, equipment and, and weapons that you see in, in, you know, in a lot of their training. So we uh, put that out. We formed what's called a Stop the Money Pipeline. Yeah, um, that kind of was the next outgrowth out of Moses God Talks, which is a nationwide a movement that tries to tie in all these various um, struggles, issues, mm -hmm. and tie them back to uh, those who are funding. Mm -hmm. And I also say profiting, you know, they're not only funding, but they profit. So they're profiting for jailing folks or they profit from yeah. these pipelines and stuff like that. Right, uh, right. Nisha, I know you uh, brought up uh, missing Mary Indigenous women um, a couple of times. So I just wanted to, to share for those who might not be unfamiliar. Um, that term itself kind of comes out of Canada. They were mm -hmm. the uh, first to really push uh, this messaging um, where they've documented uh, tens of thousands of uh, First Nation up there to call, call themselves First Nations uh, mm -hmm. who have either gone missing or murdered and uh, that language we brought down into the U.S. as well into to Mexico and other uh, territories. We have a, a phenomenally high rate of uh, Native women, First Nation women, Indigenous women who go missing and or are murdered. You know, one of the uh, connections uh, to fossil fuels is um, Canada, the Canadian government, they actually did a 10-year something inquiry study into uh, the issue. And what one of the things they found is anywhere you, you have um, fracking or mining, mm -hmm. uh, kind of desecration of the earth taking place, which typically, not only in Canada, but also in the US, a lot of these uh, projects take place on or next to reservations mm. or in Canada they're called reserves um, you have what's called man camps mm. and they're literally is what, what it sounds like they're uh, just acres and acres of these yeah. tiny, you know like mobile home type uh, uh, sheltering and it's men from around the world who are brought in to work these uh, the oil fields and stuff like that and uh, they, they also happen to be kind of the epicenter for the issue of, of trafficking of women and where a lot of the, uh, and again, since they're on or near reservations or reserves, it's primarily indigenous First Nation or Native American women who get trafficked and uh, miss, missing and or, or murdered. So um, yeah, wow. that, it, it, and sadly, I never and, knew that connection. Keep going. I'm so sorry. Keep going. Oh, no problem. Um, we, we've had some similar studies here in the, uh, the U.S. And, and sadly, you know, it's actually the, the Northwest region, that I-5 corridor from Canada all the way down to where you're at, um, <laughs> where uh, in, in Seattle, sadly, is the number one spot in the U.S. for where Native women are going missing and or, or murdered. Wow. We have a, a pretty, um, a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure 
infrastructure, as well as ports. So any port city also uh, has really high rates of uh, women who go missing and or murdered or getting trafficked into these port areas. You know, uh, the sister, I can't remember her name, but she did a movie about the missing women of Juarez, Mexico. And it was the same kind of uh, uh, situation where there were um, factories that the women worked in, uh, uh, factories that they worked in set up by corporations who wanted them to create, make, you know, make things for America. But there would be, right, they're right on the border. So any, usually it, kind of, it was a white person, a white man could cross over and do whatever he wanted, you know, take, uh, uh, kidnap the woman as she's walking home from work, you know, whatever, you know, and so anyway, this movie, essentially, she went and uncovered like the bones of women in the desert, just, you know, uh, so it was just, it was um, incredibly sad. So I wrote man camp down because can we get a man camp map? You know what I mean? Just like how they have hate group maps you know, and so that we can start being more vigilant about like these camps, you know, and just really just like not patrolling is the word that I'm thinking of, but like highlighting where these things happen and then divest or yeah. um, g g create some, you know, some something, create some infrastructure so that we are protecting our women. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in, even in terms of patrol out in, uh, uh, in the Dakotas, North and South Dakota, because uh, wherever there's construction of those pipelines to end in North Dakota is where uh, the Bakken oil fields, which is like the largest area for um, uh, natural gas extraction takes place. There's man camps all along these. But anyways, you have a lot of uh, Lakotas and uh, Lakota men specifically who are doing exactly what you mm -hmm. said about mm -hmm. forming uh, patrols and going up into these areas to uh, protect uh, the women um, in, or children, you know, and, and actually there's a lot of young boys who are, are trafficked into these camps as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to, when you're mentioning war is um, the, the connection or the similarity with uh, reservations and uh, one of the, I believe, I can't remember, uh, someone had, was talking about the stats of, of Native women being uh, murdered and what you have you know, we have reservations, we have tribal governments, but the, the federal government stripped the uh, authority of tribal governments to yep. prosecute non-native men, mm -hmm. well, now natives period, who commit mm -hmm. certain crimes on mm -hmm. reservations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what they call major crimes, you know, uh, murder, rape, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. that, that the jurisdiction falls with the federal government. Yeah. And so you essentially have the exact same situation as what you described in war as happening on reservations uh, throughout the country. That if you're a non-native individual who goes onto the reservation, mm -hmm. uh, commits murder or mm -hmm. commits rape, mm -hmm. then uh, even if the tribal police get there, they don't have the authority to arrest or detain. Mm -hmm. uh, no, excuse me, they can detain up to uh, like 12 hours or something like that. Yeah. But if uh, no federal agent comes to FBI, comes and yeah. takes it over, then that person walks free. And so you literally have kind of like a, uh, a free for all. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people know this and commit tons of crimes yeah. on uh, reservations yeah. and there's no yeah. uh, justice at yeah. all. So yeah, yeah and we the way Oh, and the way that they do, like those those kinds of uh, criminals or or psychopaths or sociopaths, they tell each other, or there's a way that they communicate. It's like, oh, there's easy pickings over there, or you know, and so it just perpetuates that. Mm -hmm. Right, and they and they know that they can hide out on reservations, yeah. you know, because uh, this the state or city law enforcement they don't have jurisdiction on reservations. You know, it's, it would be federal uh, and the feds are in on reservations looking for these these men. And so and then the, the tribal law enforcement can't do nothing about it. So wow. it's a uh, amnesty, amnesty International. Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. and they did a uh, I think it's called Maze. M-A-Z-E. Uh, 
yeah, uh, I, was, oh. I almost said maize like the corn, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> of injustice. Uh, and it really documents this kind of uh, jurisdictional issue and uh, issue of missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, mm -hmm. That it's a really good report to check out. Okay. Okay, I will. We've got 10 minutes left, Michelle. <laughs> what do you oh. We've covered oh, so that, much. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I just want to, I want to stop and pause there. I know we got 10 minutes um, left um, and I want to have an opportunity to get to some questions and answers. Actually, we have 10 minutes left to interview, but maybe we can go into Q&A. Yeah. Um, but I, I just really am thankful that we're pulling those intersections of gender into the conversation because I think um, a lot of times it gets stuck at race, um, which further invisibilizes um, indigenous women um, and, and black women as well. There were so many bells going off in my head as I was listening to you. Um, make the connection between first, going giving us that language that um, when we pillage the earth, that first relationship is fundamentally broken. Um, and then how that shows up in on women's bodies, mm -hmm. um, specifically in this case, indigenous women's bodies. And I, I thank both of you for going back to that point because now I feel like in my mind, I have a map. Like mm -hmm. now I'm thinking if there's a logging camp, if there's some type of camp yeah. that is pillaging the earth, that women are at risk. Um, and, I, and I think about that as a part of the Americas, um, yeah. just like uh, Shonda brought up from Colombia mm -hmm. to Brazil to here. Mm -hmm. And, and my, also my second thought was thinking of sporting events and these events that also have a um, um, hyper-masculine presence and then women are, um, women at, are risk. Often at risk in these spaces. Yeah. So um, thank you just for bringing back that gender, that gender yeah. component to yeah. to that and i just want the audience to really um really sit with that and and take that away um as as they think yeah. about um yeah. our knowledge sharing today yeah 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 no that's amazing is there anything else matt that you want to maybe highlight for us that we haven't talked about so far uh um, the only thing I was thinking, I know uh, we, we talked about voting a few times and I hadn't yeah. really said anything on that. In terms of the federal uh, level um, you know, or national elections, I mean, one, one of the importances in voting is uh, the jurisdictional side that mm -hmm. it, at least for tribes, the, the vast majority of our issues end up in the courts. Mm -hmm. They always do, whether it's fights over uh, natural resources, the land, these pipelines, you know, all of these various things, uh, even MMIW, they're going to end up, if they even take the case, are going to end up in federal courts. Mm -hmm. So uh, voting, uh, at least in the presidential elections, with the understanding that that uh, uh, party is going to be putting in uh, justices at all different levels, you know, it's extremely important. Right, right. Uh, federal, federal, uh, statewide, uh, and then there are other like. Uh, um, I I heard something that said tr Trump has appointed 129 or maybe 89 judges since he's been in office, and one of them was black, of color. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can you, yeah. Precisely, you know, and so yeah, in, in the same. I mean, in that, I guess it's not just specific to, to tribal communities, but uh, communities period where our issues end up in the courts. You, you're gonna come in front of a judge, and so uh, that that's super important. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like to stress that um, we often almost over glamorize presidential elections and mm -hmm. gloss over the uh, like our our Congress, our Senate. Yes. You know, they're the ones that make the laws. Level. The midterms, know, yeah. Midterms, and then mm -hmm. even all the way down to the local level, you know, yeah. whether it's your city councils or your school boards, yep. because uh, I'm a super big believer that we can uh, have more impact um, on the local level, mm. but that those, that can reverberate, you know, to other communities, you know, then it's empowering too, you know, you, you build uh, mm -hmm. other leadership mm -hmm. Uh, in other uh, communities to to run similar campaigns. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. seen that absolutely with the banking issue, mm -hmm. um, but other issues as well that we've been able to pass on mm -hmm. the, the local level and then um, reverberate that out. I mean, we passed uh, a Green New Deal in Seattle, you know, wow. that sets our targets to 
uh, uh, eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The federal government. Congratulations. Ain't That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and we and you can tweak it to be very specific to your communities. Mm -hmm. So our Green New Deal wasn't a carbon copy of what um, the federal government's talking about. Mm -hmm. We we t made it very specific to Seattle and even more specific to the communities in Seattle who are most impacted by environmental racism, which up here, you know, where I live is uh, South Seattle. South mm -hmm. Seattle is like seventy percent um, people of color. And not too surprising, that's where the majority of the hazardous and toxic waste facilities are located. Mm -hmm. It's so lower life expectancy, poor health outcomes, et cetera, um, high rates of asthma, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. our Green New Deal was focused on um, protecting our communities first, addressing the, the pollution uh, issues in our communities. And so, you know, the, no, there's nothing stopping any community from passing similar things and um, their communities as well. You mentioned your yeah, that playbook. Oh, go ahead. My apologies. Oh, I mean, I know, I know DC is like uh, notorious for environmental racism issues. I had a chance back in the late '90s to go. The um, I totally forget the name of the EJ group that was there, but they held what's called a, a toxic tour, and they took oh. some of us. Um, uh, EJ organizers are around places in DC and were showing us these spots where uh, uh, pollution and these factories were taking place and it was pretty horrendous. So uh, but in LA, I mean, everywhere, it's this, the same story. Might, the community might be different, you yeah. know, it might be a black community, might be a native yeah. community, yeah. might be a Latino, Hispanic Latina, community. yeah, mm -hmm. it, but it's the same issue. And I think you also, like you're saying, like, look how much Seattle has, you have achieved within Seattle at the local level. And that also just shows how important those local elections um, are because it's the everyday matters that most closely affect us. So, mm -hmm. and um, just just the work that you're doing is, is incredible because now I'm starting to think about things differently within my own space and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what ways we can copy, <laughs> yep. copy, copy and paste and, and create uh -huh. alliances that way. And I hope the community, like our, our face, like our listeners are thinking along the same lines. And I know for me, as a, as a poet who, and a, and a lecturer who goes internationally, now that I know that these are some of the ways, the things that we need to look at, I can gear some of my workshops, my writing workshops and my talks towards mm -hmm. like this piece of the first mother is mother earth. How do we write about this and connect her to uh, institutional racism, environmental racism. Um, you know, how do we, so, so I'm, I'm working on that as we're talking, Matt. So thank you, yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. And we, um, we have a question also, someone at, is asking you, uh, is there a Mother Earth healing restoration ceremony where all Native, Native, in, Native Indians, but American Indians or, or, or indigenous peoples and African Native Indians gather? So that's one question. Some ceremony with guidance of our chiefs and our native healers. That was one question. I, I think. Um, Want me to read it again? Specifically oh. to to out here. I mean, I don't know, you know, more broadly beyond uh, the Northwest and, uh, but yeah, I, every every tribe has, uh, you know, various uh, mm -hmm. ceremonies that are specific to their geographies. Uh, so, you know, if you come out here to the Northwest, a lot of it's going to be centered around water, you know, because we live near the water. Mm -hmm. um, and, and specifically to uh, salmon, you know, that's there. So much of their culture is tied up into mm -hmm. the salmon in the plains. It's mostly around uh, buffalo. But what mm -hmm. I want to say, you know, any of our ceremonies, um, they're, uh, they're, they're focused on the uh, that reconnection for one, um, but almost like uh, it, it's our, so let me take a step back. So in our origin stories, and, and what I wanna say is I hear this from tribal communities around the globe. It, they might sound a little bit different, but if you really listen, there's similarities, no matter uh, what country or continent you go to. Mm -hmm. um, 
you're going to hear talks about very specific roles and responsibilities those tribal communities have that are are specifically connected to to land to to water to community and uh, how i kind of explain that is that you know if you look out your window you know and you see them them trees you know right now they're they're filtering that carbon and releasing oxygen mm -hmm. and so we would say that uh, that's it's one one of its uh, original instructions uh, that it doesn't filter that carbon just so it can live. It's doing that as a responsibility to all other creation to to have oxygen to live. Uh, if you go into the the, the dirt, you, you have them worms that are you know uh, putting nutrients into uh, the soil for things to grow. Uh, again, not for just it to live, um, but for all things mm -hmm. to be able to, to grow. And you can literally go through all of mm -hmm. species, all our other relatives, mm -hmm. and something that they do in their everyday life is contributing for life to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, if we understand that we, all of us humans, are a part of uh, the earth and we're, we're connected to all, because we all come from the same thing, mm -hmm. then obviously we have a responsibility uh, as well. And so what you will hear is these various communities around the globe will talk about that in their ceremonies, which again, might look different than how we do things in the plains or how these tribes out here mm -hmm. or uh, if, uh, folks in Canada, Brazil, Africa, yeah. Australia, New Zealand, it might look different, but that they're going back to those original uh, instructions and teachings and ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So within that question, um, that specifically uh, is addressing that, you know, yeah. we have one of our ceremonies, uh, we call it the Inipi. Mm -hmm. um, in, in English, they'll call it a sweat, but it's not really a sweat. Uh, in, inipi, mm -hmm. uh, what that means is they're, they're going um, to live again, mm -hmm. basically be reborn again, that we're, mm -hmm. we're going into this ceremony to uh, one, cleanse ourselves off, because all of us need to cleanse us of the, the mm -hmm. negative things that attach mm -hmm. itself to us, mm -hmm. but then to to come out of, uh, of that lodge um, and be kind of whole again. And so that's for everybody, yeah. you know, uh, these, they don't have to be sp specific, but so I don't know if I'm necessarily uh, answering that question, but just, yeah. I guess, no, I think, that, yeah, that history, sharing that history is important, you know, and the, the knowing, not just history, but sharing the knowing is important. I think, and for the people, whoever's asking that question, they're probably wondering where they can go because I get a lot of questions like that. Oh, and okay. yeah, and so, and I think maybe pow, like some powwows where there are, um, so there are places where I dance. So, um, so I'm also on the council of the, um, there's a black Indian powwow that we're trying to organize in North Carolina. Um, and so I can actually post that on I Love um, Sanctuary as well. And I think it's one of the first ones that would happen in North Carolina. But there are also nations that identify as, um, as, as Black Indian. So in Virginia, there's the Nottaway. Um, the Nottaway powwow happens usually in September. The Cherenhaka Nottaway, um, Piscataway. Uh, and then so there are other nations that don't identify as Black and Native, but you see them in the circles. So there are in North Carolina, um, there are the Kahari, my nation. Uh, one of my nations, there's also the Halawa Saponi, um, the uh, Okanichi. I mean, there's nations all up and down the Southeast <laughs> where, where people look like us. They, you know, so for this person who's asking the question, where can you go for those healing ceremonies? Um, first and foremost, it, 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 it's not always a healing ceremony. Sometimes it's just a gathering that you go to first. And then sometimes you'll be invited to the healing ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's what they're what they're asking. Yeah. yeah, the most important key to that, no matter where it is, is uh, your relationships. And, and yeah. then the stronger relationships, then um, you'll get invited to those spaces. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some some communities rightfully t will sometimes be guarded because there's so much mm -hmm. exploitation that can happen of, mm -hmm. of ceremony and, and yeah. stuff like that. that yeah. uh, they want to, to know that folks aren't coming around because they want to uh, steal, you know, knowledge or steal mm -hmm. ceremony and then go profit off of it. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
Exactly. Exactly. Um, I could say out here, if, if the individual happens to be in the Northwest, um, in, the, in this uh, Washington specifically, they have what's called the annual tribal canoe uh, journey. Oh. And it's, it's so beautiful. It's a, they've revived a, a kind of an old way of traveling for village sites mm -hmm. uh, via canoe. And uh, it's, it takes like literally over a month for a mm -hmm. month they're going from different wow. reservations or villages. And it started 20 years ago, actually in Seattle. Seattle is the home of the Duwamish people. They mm. revived it here, mm. and but it has spread. And now you have, I, I think last year they had like 150 plus. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't just uh, Native American tribes or First Nations in Canada, mm. but you also now have the Maori who come over. You have uh, uh, Hawaiians, uh, different wow. Pacific Islanders uh, that I knew. I'm pronouncing that correct. Mm -hmm. Indigenous okay. Japanese. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they come over and um, uh, there were some African canoes that came over and they're participating wow. uh, in this. It's I'd love to come. Oh, you when, should definitely come up and experience it. Place? Usually in uh, late, mid July through uh, early August. And uh, okay. what they have is a host nation. If every year a different tribe will be kind of like the host. Mm -hmm. And so all these various weeks, the, the canoes will be stopping at different uh, villages and then end up at the host tribe. And then they have what's called protocol. Mm -hmm. And protocol is where um, whoever that, that tribe is, they come out to um, the dance floor and they share, they share their songs, mm. dances, uh sometimes they're creation stories and it's it's like amazing you know uh and it, actually we got tribes way up into alaska who come down and uh, participate as well that's very nice. very moving i'm coming next time if, if we're know. done we're done with covid COVID ain't happen yeah. <laughs> yeah but i'm gonna come keep me posted and our over here in uh in california so there are so we have bear camps in the mountains of california um, that's how I was introduced to Anipe. Uh, and um, so we have had, and I'm, I don't want to speak for the, the keepers of the land. Um, um, uh, so, but in terms of participating with the ceremony, we've had people come. Uh, the um, Aztec dancers have come. We've had Yaqui deer dancers come. Uh, you know, we've had African, you know, dancers come. And so it's been like a communal experience. And then of course, you know, the bears dance. And uh, uh, so it's been a really, really amazing. People have come from Europe, you know, to participate in that ceremony, but it's, that's, a, that's another ceremony where you want to, we're protective of the space. So it's like, you have to be invited <laughs> to that, um, to that kind of a thing. But um, people always ask me, how do I start? And I always say, show up, to those first places, which are the, the gatherings, you know, which are the powwows, you know, show up first there and then start maybe talking to some of the vendors, you know, and asking them questions in a respectful way and making sure you don't grab anyone's regalia, you know, and you just like talk to people and like, hey, you know, if you know who your nations are, you can start saying my, my mother said my people uh, come from here. And then you start making those relations. So I think, yeah. Like, like with anything, building relationships on any person, right? You, yep. you can't be um, welcome into the community if you have not yep. um, tried to yep. build relationships because not everything should you have access to, right? So that, that is part of the pillaging <laughs> that we're trying to avoid. So thank you for reminding us because with anything, it's a relationship. Yeah. Yep. Do we have another question on the... I'm just trying to see. Do, um, we, or we have a comment. So we have a Lynn. Lynn oh, yeah, I saw that one. Jope, like a Lynn Jope. She said she's my relative. Oh, okay. <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> That's kind of cool. There you go, right the cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so send me a DM, DM me, Lynn. <laughs> Let me know how yeah. we're cousins. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Do we, if we have any more questions, um, mm. I guess I'll let us know. Yeah. But I have learned so much. Um, yeah. And I've, I've shifted just in 
this, let's see, what's been an hour and two minutes. Um, I've shifted so much because you've given me so, given us so much language, um, first relationships with the earth and mm -hmm. uh, going back, just thinking about how all of these things are related and, and looking at space and how we're connecting to space and how we're connected to each other through these historical traumas. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very, very thankful. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this and is grateful. Incredible. Yeah, mm -hmm. and how we can make change. Like to me, that's the most important thing as a as a writer, as a poet. I always look at how language is transformational. And then in in ceremony, uh, one of the things that one of my sisters taught me, of course, you know, when you ask, be be careful what you ask for, <laughs> uh, because words are power. And then also the piece about um, just being able to connect your prayer with action, I guess for me, you know? And so when I'm thinking about what's, hap what's about to happen with these elections and, uh, you know, and with the midterms, which is in two years that we have to pay attention to as well, we all have to just kind of be more vigilant and start trying to actually activate in our own communities like Matt, you know, has been doing and using the playbook, which we're gonna post the playbook on I Love Ancestry and Mother Earth Sanctuary and my page and Michelle, maybe your page. So we can just yes. like spread it out, you know, spread it out. Yeah, so thank you, Matt. Thank, yes, you. thank you, I appreciate Matt. it. Is there anything you need, do you, you know how to get a hold of me? I'm happy to, to share anytime. Yes, okay. we would definitely like to, to share with you. You are definitely the good relative and charging. Yes. You embody yeah, that. I appreciate so, that. <laughs> uh, I, I love that, that. Now that I know what that means, I mean, that just gives us so, are we good relative to one another, to the earth, yep. to each other? And um, how can we use our own thunder to really activate and use those tools? Mm -hmm. Voting is one tool. Thank you for bringing that home. Voting yeah. is just one of the tools. Yeah. Matt has given us many tools that he is using and following the money and so that playbook is is the follow-up um so thank you thank you for putting that in my consciousness i was excited about that and i hope that it definitely resonated with everyone listening to us today you gotta get me the name of that record store so i can go check it out oh yeah <laughs> okay shout out to my cousin tom tunnel records okay <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is so Thank cool. You. Thanks so much, everyone. You all take care. Thanks Bye. for joining Morning Coffee with. Yes, Morning Coffee. And see you next month. <laughs> Thank you. Bob. Thanks, Matt. Take care. Thank you. Blessings. Have a good day. You too.